Okay, hi everyone. I'm Tanya and I'm so excited to be here. It's probably well known that OWASP makes my favorite conferences. <laughs> I love OWASP so much. I'm a lifetime member. I used to be a project leader. I used to be a chapter leader. I helped chap start a new chapter in my city in Victoria, BC. I'm from Canada. I have an accent. At some point I will say, aboot, but I will tell you I did not. <laughs> I do not believe it, even though I've seen it on video. Um, and today I want to talk to you about DevSecOps worst practices. So I do all sorts of things. I have many jobs, which I'll talk about on the About Me slide. But one of the things I've been doing since 2018 is doing consulting calls through this company called IONS Research. And over the years, I've been able to meet with over 300 AppSec teams. And so these are DevSecOps errors that I've seen over and over and over. So almost all of them I've seen at least 10 companies do. There's, there's one or two where it's just a handful, but they're so terrible, I had to tell you. And so we're gonna go over 15 things and why we should not do those things so we can have better experiences. And so, yeah, let's do this. Okay, so what are we gonna talk about today? DevSecOps. We're gonna talk about tried, tested, and failed approaches. <laughs> Um, and then how and why we could avoid them. And so some of these are people things, some of these are tool things, and some of these are processes things, just like DevOps, people, products, and processes. Or I don't know if you want to use the three Ps. Okay, so let's go. Um, so the first thing is uh, about me. So this is the mandatory I am competent slide, so bear with me. Um, so I'm the head nerd at We Hack Purple. Oh, not anymore. Um, we, I, we got acquired by SunGrab just like three months ago. So I'm very excited to be the new head of community and education. And so all the free stuff that you previously saw from me is just gonna move over there and I'm just gonna get to create lots of free stuff all the time, like as a job, which is pretty cool. Um, I'm also known as SheHacks Purple. My slides have decided to progress on their own. I wrote a book. Um, I, <laughs> Apparently, it's just gonna do it for me. Um, so I worked in tech, this is my year 27. Um, I started We Hack Purple, OWASP, DevSlop, Cyber Mentoring Monday, WOSEC, I'm an advisor, and I'm faculty at IANS, and I guess it's just gonna do it. Okay, so that's me if I brush my hair. Yes, let's go. Okay, so more interesting stuff. The resting AppSec face. <laughs> um, you did what now? What have you done? Um, and so, um, I want to talk about my definition of DevSecOps and then kind of like everyone else's definition so that you can kind of see where I'm coming from. So I like to think of it as an AppSec person who works in a DevOps environment. And so I still want the same things I've always wanted. I still want to help them create rugged, tough, awesome software that's safe to use. That's what I want, but I'm going to change the way I do stuff so if they're doing sprints, I got to learn how to sprint. If they're going to use a pipeline, I need to learn when to use it and when to not use it so I'm not annoying. Um, so if they're doing DevOps things, I need to get along with them. And I don't know if you were in the keynote this morning with Brooke where he's like, if you put three DevOps tools together overnight, there's a litter of 18 DevOps tools in the morning. And it's true. And so you have to adjust the way you do stuff. But that's what I think. A more common definition that I see from other people, and it's okay if this is your definition, but it's the AppSec person that owns the tools. So you're like, I'm the AppSec person and I own the tools, I do DevSecOps. So sometimes that's also me, where like, I'm just like the tool nerd, and then we have the architect, and then we have like the pen tester, and I'm just like, I'm gonna automate everything, yay! So whichever definition you have, that's okay. But the idea is, is we have to work nicely with the DevOps folks and complement the things they're doing, like work with them instead of against the grain. So we don't wanna be, have you, any of you ever pet a cat backwards and it looks at you like, <sighs> we don't wanna be that guy. Okay, so um, DevSecOps isn't easy and sometimes it goes wrong. Rarely people talk about why. So I used to work in the Canadian government for 13 and a half years before I switched into private industry. And I remember someone asking like, hey, can you give us some lessons learned? I'm like, no, I'm under NDA. I can't share anything. I'm not even allowed telling people at conferences which governmental department I work at. <laughs> and so I couldn't share. And so a lot of us don't share. 
And so because I've worked with over 300 companies and because IAN serves like a thousand companies, <laughs> no one knows which ones I'm talking about and therefore I would be able to share data. But there's lots of us who have lots of things to share and we're under some sort of non-disclosure where we feel like we can't. And I'm hoping by me sharing this that some of you start to share a tiny bit more. I'm not saying run around breaking NDAs, but sometimes we can share a bit more than we do and sometimes we need to be a little vulnerable and brave. And so I'm hoping some of you might do that. Okay, so number one, uh, breaking builds on false positives. So when we do DevOps, uh, we use this awesome thing called a CI CD, sometimes called a DevOps pipeline. There's all sorts of tests and cool stuff happening in there. We're building code or deploying code. We're like releasing infrastructure, booting it up, doing stuff to it, torturing it if you're me. Um, and ideally, if a test fails, it's because the test literally failed and there's something wrong with your app. And it's not because your tool's just spitting out false positives and making everyone sad. And so this is the number one thing I see the most often. I see people who are really well-meaning, who take their super old tool that was designed in 2008 or 2004 or 2002, and then they put it in a CI CD and they're like, oh, the vendor said it works with DevOps. I'm like, I work at a vendor. I, like, I, liked, I would love to say that they're all honest all the time, but just because it turns on in a CI CD and it technically runs in a CI CD does not mean that's where it should go. Um, like you can use a hammer as a doorstop, but that's not what it's meant for, right? And so I think it's really important if you have a tool that has lots of false positives to either one, change the way you use it completely, or two, use it outside the pipeline um, and somehow feed those results into the pipeline. So an example, so let's say you have a stack analysis tool and it gives a lot of false positives. So maybe it's open source and free and so the rule set's not awesome. Maybe it's an older one that can find everything under the sun, but it's gonna, but it, it just has a lot of false positives. It finds lots of things that aren't a thing. That's okay. What you can do is you can put it outside the CICD, run it, get the results, you look through it, then you add that data to, let's say, an ASOC, an Application Security Orchestration and Correlation tool, and then maybe the CICD checks that. Maybe um, you have a policy set, and you, oh, there's so many things you can do to like get that data outside the CICD, and people are like, oh, it's not automated. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> because some tools aren't good at that. Like if you if you sit there and you give a dev like. Um, I've never seen a 72,000 page report like Brooke said, but I have seen um, one app I scanned with 43,000 vulnerabilities with a stack analysis tool. And I'm just like, no, I give up, I'm going home, bye. <laughs> I'm done with this. And you can still find lots of cool things with tools like that, but you can't do it in an automated fashion. So it's okay to use tools like that, but don't put them in the pipeline. Or take out almost all the rules and just put the super high signal rules in the ones where you know for sure they're good. So maybe you're only checking 10 things because those are the 10 things that keep you up at night and put that in the CI CD. It'll run really fast and you'll get good results, but don't just keep doing things the old way because you will not make friends and not influence people. Okay, so yes, I like to call this the boy that cried wolf. We don't wanna be that boy. Okay, so the next one is turning tools on without testing them. And so this might sound like number one, oh, false positives. But false positives is only one of the things. So I have seen this many times where um, a developer, like um, an AppSec person, they bought a tool, like maybe they used it at their old office or they've seen a lot of advertising or whatever reason, they're like, this is gonna be awesome. Sometimes the CISO is like, I bought you a present and I'm like, eh, why'd you get that one? Um, but whatever, so a tool has landed in your lap and you turn it, you just put it directly into the CIC. You didn't run it manually. You didn't automate it overnight. You didn't look at it a whole bunch of different apps to see how it's going. You didn't work with an agile team and then a DevOps team and a waterfall team to see if it's gonna be a good time. You didn't test with different programming languages and frameworks. You're just like, I'm just gonna go for gold and put it in the CI CD and just see what happens and waste everyone's time. So what could happen is it crashes. What could happen is it runs for like 18 hours. There was a tool that I had to use for a client say uh, in 2021 and there was like this little checkbox stop scan after six hours. I was like, what is that? That, yeah, that became my favorite checkbox. 
you can't run, like you can't put a tool that's gonna run six hours. So you need to make sure it actually runs, it doesn't crash, uh, the results are actually good and valuable. It, it's able to scan the stuff that you're trying to scan it with. Like all of these things are what you should start with. So you start with manual testing of this tool to see if you like it. I do this a lot before I even want to buy anything because I'm like, what if I make my client pay like thousands of dollars and then it sucks? So, I, so we call this tuning. So tuning tools. Um, and that means, or actually no, this is just testing. This is just making sure I have another one about tuning. Okay, so next, artificial gates. So I just wrote a blog post about this. So instead of creating a policy to have a gated process, someone decides they're gonna use the CICD in a way they're not supposed to, to make a gate, because they can't keep up. Um, remember, again, back to Brooke, he talked about the gated security process. Who's worked in a gated security process before? Okay, keep your hand up for a second. Who liked it? <laughs> hmm, no hands, it's so weird. <laughs> it's so slow, it's not effective, everyone has to wait on us, which makes it extremely expensive, right? So we move to DevOps to stop having those gates. But I have worked at, with a lot of people where they're like, I can't wait until I'm allowed breaking builds because I'm gonna break every single build. <laughs> so that then they have to come talk to me. They have to come to me, like as though developers are like little people that are like peons and minions that have to come beg for approval, which I, bleh, I don't like that at all. And they're like, they have to come to me. They have to jump through these hoops. I'm like, no, that's not what we're doing anymore. This is not a circus, there's no hoop jumping. This is like, we're one team. We are working together. You want them to release code as fast as possible that is secure. What are you doing? Um, so I've seen this quite a bit, this attitude of like, oh, I'll use the CI CD to make a gate because I'm scared and I can't keep up. And I'm really afraid that they're gonna release something that's not safe there's gonna be an incident and I'm gonna look like a fool. And so when I see this behavior, it's almost always fear. And this might sound odd. So like if you see someone behaving like super not cool at work, it's almost always fear. It's from insecurity of some sort, which is really fear. And when you talk to them about it, it's like, so what are you afraid of? They're like, I'm not afraid of anything. I'm like, well, clearly you are, because you're breaking policy and you're being a weirdo. So what's actually going on, dude? Let's talk about it. And so this is not a technical one, this is a feeling one. And I like really sucked at feelings, because I was a dev, I was just like, I'll just write code to do the thing. Um, when I switched to security, I had to learn like empathy, and like negotiation and persuasion, it's ridiculous. Um, and so this is one where you're gonna have to actually talk to other humans. I know it's the worst, right? Okay, number four, missing test results. So this might sound nuts to some of you, um, but, I have worked at a lot of places where, okay, so when DevOps folks do tests, the artifact is like right there in the CI CD. And then so if it fails, it's like click and they're like, oh, that's why. See how that was fast and easy? But security folks are like, oh, it failed. Okay, so then I'm gonna remote desktop into this uh, jump server. Then I'm gonna use MFA to log in in another account. Then I'm gonna open up this thing and I have to log into the tool. Then I have to figure out where my project is. Then I'm like, oh, where was that scan? And then I'm like, oh, I open it up and then it's 43,000 vulnerabilities. And then I'm like, oh, there's mine. No one does it. <laughs> the results can't be off on another server somewhere. The results need to be in Jira or Bugzilla or the CI CD where the devs look all day. It needs to be in the IDE where they're programming all, all day. If you put it in some faraway spot, they will fix way less bugs, and that is not what any of us in this room want. We want them to, f okay, so in my dreams, they fix every bug, but in reality, at least they fix some, right? But if you hide the bugs so they cannot get to them, they won't fix them, and this sounds really obvious, I hope, um, but in reality, I see this over and over again. Well, if we put all the security bugs into Jira, like some hacker could get into Jira and then search for security bugs and then there's like a map of how to attack us. Okay, so if someone got into our network and then they managed to get like an account in Jira, like is that where I would go as an attacker first? You know, I'm gonna look at the bug tracker. <laughs> no, that's not what they would do. There's like a thousand other ways they would crush us at that point. It's not, Jira is not the one that's gonna be the problem. Um, and so, 
I always am advocating for like, let's put our bugs where they are. If there's, for instance, if there's a secret and the secret's alive, you don't want to put the secret in there. Um, but other than that, I'm like, eh, it's probably fine. If it's super sensitive, go talk to them. But like most bugs, I think should go in there personally. Okay, runaway tests. So um, we talked briefly about how you want to test your tools before you put them in. So some tests run forever. And so I, I was working with a SAST provider. So I hated SAST uh, until like 2020. I was just like, why would anyone ever do this? <laughs> it hurts so bad. Uh, and I focused more on dynamic and software composition analysis and like manual code review because I just couldn't stand SAST tools. Then next gen came out and it started to make more sense. But so I was working with this vendor for like over two years for one of my clients and they're like, our scans take seven to 15 minutes. I'm like, no, it's an hour and a half. And they're like, our scans take seven to 15 minutes. And I'm like, are you just like gaslighting me? Like I'm telling you I timed it and it's an hour and a half. The fastest one we've ever run was 45 minutes. And they just kept telling me and telling me it runs really fast. I'm like, but it doesn't run really fast. The second. Um, and so what it would do is it would take up all the resources so no one else could run that scan. So everyone else's CI CD was waiting on that hour and a half scan. So then, you know, team A started and team B runs theirs and it's like you have to wait for that engine. Then team C starts and they're still waiting. Then they go talk to team A, team A is like, oh, I don't know, security, they're doing stuff again. And then every seven times, that test would run like all night because they would do a full scan of your whole code base. And it's not okay to use up all the test results. So I also did this with a dynamic scanner. I was like, oh, I'm so cool. I took this open source DAST. Um, and I'm like, I aimed it at the dev server in my CI CD. I'm like, I am so cool. It's going to be awesome. The OWASP dev slot project people were very patient with me. <laughs> and it would run and run and run and run. And it's like, it's crawling, it's spidering, it's doing this, it's doing that. And they're like, Tanya, I don't have all day to work on this open source project. Could your desk scanner stop? And it would just like block everyone else's work. And that's the part about this test that, or this item that's important, is that you're blocking other people from doing their work. So no one else could run stuff against the dev server because I had monopolized all the resources. No one else could run the CI CD because I had monopolized all the resources. Like no one else could work because Tanya was running her silly DAST or SAS scans. And so it's really important that when you do tool, like running tools, that you make sure, even if it's outside the CICD, that you're not blocking everyone else from doing their work. This is especially important if you're using a server that doesn't belong to you. So like, let's say you're using the dev server. <clears throat> that's what I was doing. Um, that dev team, there's like 18 of them, and that's theirs, it's not mine. So you wanna be polite, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Okay, number six, um, impossible service level agreements. So again, this is one of those ones where when I explain it, everyone's like, it's so obvious, no one would ever do that. I'm like, people do it to me every month. Um, so I like to have two service level agreements. So one is for the first time I scan. So I've scanned your app for the first time, Tanya has showed up. Uh, this is like a, a mark in the sand with whichever tool we've gotten. Those are legacy bugs. Those bugs currently exist. And then every new bug after that. So new bugs after that, I'm not gonna allow mediums or above. You don't get to make new terrible mistakes once I show up. And I don't like that. But let's say you have a whole bunch of criticals and highs and mediums. In the old one, I'm like, cool. For the next six months, let's work on criticals. And so whenever the scans go out after that, if you make a new bug, no. But if it's one of the old bugs, you can still go to prod. I hope this sounds logical. I like to think it is. However, lots of AppSec folks who are always older than me, and I'm older than I look, um, but people, for whatever reason, maybe it's perfectionism, they're like, no, it can't go out because there's bugs in it. Yeah, I know that the bugs are already in prod. All of that 100 bugs are already in prod. And we're gonna have 98 bugs now. So it's awesome. They're like, I don't let criticals go to prod. Like, no, no they're, they're, they're already there. These aren't new ones. They're, I'm fixing two. And like, it's not going. I kid you not. Um, one of my friends, she replaced me on a contract and she quit earlier this year. We, we had a discussion over wine and she explained how she had done a search in the issues and found several critical bug fixes from me and three figures worth from her. 
of critical bug fixes, they'd never been merged because the senior AppSec guy didn't let critical bugs go into prod. And so there were hundreds of critical bug fixes and high bug fixes that he would not let go because the number wasn't zero. And so this sounds silly, but I literally see this at office after office after office where they're like, I'm doing a good job. The buck stops here. And I'm like, what have you done? So this is my opinion. <laughs> okay, next, untrained staff. Um, so when I was in the Canadian government, our, so I don't know if you know, but the Canadian dollar is not worth what the American dollar is. And I like to really exaggerate it. <laughs> but basically we would get uh, 2,225 Canadian dollars, which is about 1,500 American dollars, if we're lucky, um, per year to train, which means you get exactly zero training, right? Like there's no security training uh, that's not from We Hack Purple that you can take, which is why I started We Hack Purple. Um, and all of it's free now. Um, but basically, so here we are like moving to DevOps and moving to the cloud with 200,000 IT staff with no training. Guess how well it went. Guess what a great job we did. Guess how every project was a complete success and totally on time and on budget. No. <laughs> so if you are gonna make everyone move to Kubernetes, that's cool. Kubernetes is cool. You need to give them Kubernetes training. <laughs> and oh, we only have a budget of this is not an acceptable thing. If you can, like, put the, the training on part of the budget. Whatever it is that you need to do. You so I, I've seen this over and over again, where like they don't give adequate training to the team and then the team makes mistakes and it's not, and then they're like, oh, they're so stupid. I'm like, they're not stupid. How could they possibly know they're supposed to check this box that's like five menus deep and that they didn't and then this happened? How could they know that? They're not stupid. They're doing the best they can with what you gave them and you gave them nothing. And so I'd like to note that if you are gonna switch to DevOps, try to enable your team. And I no longer sell training, so I'm no longer biased. I just give it away for free. Um, so I, I think I don't do Kubernetes, even though Kubernetes is cool. Um, but like, we really, really need to set them up for success, and this will create more confident, awesome employees who feel invested in, who feel valued, and then have job security feelings, which then means they'll wanna work for you longer and have better morale and fewer absentee days. So it's like win, 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 win. Okay, yeah, mistakes that could have been avoided. Okay, so bugs lost in the backlog. Wait, wait, wait. Don't worry, Tanya, it's in the backlog. That's why I'm worried, buddy. <laughs> so some bugs can go into the backlog and that's cool, but like, so, okay, so a thing I like to do, like is a strong word, but a thing I do is I'll go through like Jira, Bugzilla, GitHub issues, wherever you're using, it does not matter. And I'll look at bugs that have been open like 90 days, like more and more and more. And it's like, why are these bugs still open? And like if it's a low bug, I understand why, but if it's higher, it's critical, and it's an AppSec bug, why? And I try to make deals with teams. So sometimes it's, um, like a software composition analysis type of bug. It's like, oh, this library has this critical vulnerability. But if we update off of that, we have to re-architect the entire app and that's gonna cost like at least 100K. I have a budget of exactly zero to fix this bug, so I was gonna do nothing. And I'm like, ooh. <laughs> or uh, I wanted to fix the bug, but I got moved to another project and we actually have no one maintaining this app right now or whatever. So I try to like every so often look through the old bugs that are important to me that I think need to be fixed. And it's like, why have they gone past a certain date? So this sounds weird, but it's easy to just have them get lost back there and just look at like the dashboard and the numbers. But instead, if you can go and like look at individual ones and be like, oh, actually that's pretty disconcerting. Maybe I should write the team and ask them about it. Sometimes they forgot. Sometimes like uh, their boss was like, we'll do that later and later is never. Right? But if you can come and check in on them, sometimes they'll just go and they'll fix the thing and it's awesome. Uh, sometimes you have to have a discussion. Uh, in 2021, this one team, they're just like, our app makes $2 million a year. We have four customers. We would have to rewrite the whole thing to do what you said and that will be at least 200K. Uh, we don't have, like, what do we do? And so we bought our customers WAFs and then we added our signature for what that looked like and then we decided that that reduced the risk enough. Is that a perfect answer? No. Is that way better than the nothing that they had been doing? Yeah. 
in my opinion, you're allowed to not agree. Okay, nine, no positive reinforcement. Negative Nellies everywhere. A lot of security teams are really negative. When I was a dev, so obviously I wasn't supposed to do it, but I would call them Dr. No. Oh, there's Team No. Oh, there's Dr. No himself, their leader. Uh, and I remember one day we had like this open office, so we had like half cubicles. And I saw the security guy coming, and I went like that. And my boss looked at me, and he's like, hi, doctor, I mean Bruce. <laughs> my boss was just like, this is not cool. And I'm like, I can't get anything done. The guy shows up, and he breaks all my projects. All my deadlines are done. Everything's toast. All he ever says is no. I'll say, OK, we can't do that. Cool, what can we do? You're a dove, you should know. Well, if I know, don't you think I would have done it? Like, you came and said no, what am I allowed doing? Well, you should know. So management ended up getting involved and told him he's not allowed just saying no. He can say, no, you can't do that, but here is another option or multiple options. Or we'll book an appointment and we will brainstorm together till we come up with a way that you can still meet your business requirement. And so security teams often show up and give bad news. They give a lot of bad news. And like that's part of our job is breaking bad news sometimes, right? But I would like it if we could give good news sometimes. So you have ideally some dashboards, right? And like we often focus on like what's wrong and what we need to fix and what we need to clean up and that's cool. But what if once a week you went through and looked for who's awesome and then told them they're being awesome? What if we went and looked, oh, this team fixed the most bugs this week, so I'm gonna give them a pretend award and the award is team that fixed the most bugs this week. And I'm gonna send an email or put it in the shout out channel on Slack or whatever it is that you do. And be like, I just wanna shout out this team because you fixed this many bugs and I think you're amazing. This might sound like such a little tiny silly thing that you don't have time for because most of us are overworked if we work in security. I feel like I don't need to ask you to raise your hands because your hands are probably tired because you're overworked. Um, but like, if we can spend like just a little bit of time and congratulate people when they do a good job, they're way more likely to talk to us. They're way more likely to do a thing when we ask them nicely. They're way more likely to report something to us. I have found that being friendly, and especially if you have any sort of budget for carbs or sugar, um, bribes work really well, like food, like muffins. <laughs> um, I, like whatever you can do to be like just slightly more positive and recognize people who have done a good job, this will get you in the door for so many other conversations that will be helpful later. And so especially if you're starting a new job, if you can start off your foot on that, like, oh, I looked over the things and I just wanna say like this team are a bunch of rock stars and this one person, oh my gosh, you're a little bug slayer. And it, it sounds silly, but then those people are like, hmm, you're the first nice thing a security person's ever said to me. Like, you'll be like so different than every security person they've worked with before. Just like a little bit of just positive reinforcement when you see something good. Okay, so number 10 is only worrying about your part. And this is ignoring the, oh no, this is the first way of DevOps, not the third way. What am I doing there? Okay, so the first way of DevOps, and these are the rules we're supposed to follow to make sure we're doing all of DevOps, is emphasizing the speed of the entire system, the efficiency of every single part, which, and then in my head, there's a whisper, not just your part, Tanya. Because as a dev, I was like, here's my code, good luck with that ops. Because um, <laughs> I just did my part, my part was awesome. Every other part doesn't matter, that's your problem. That doesn't work with DevOps, we have to work together. And so I find that sometimes security folks just worry about our part. Am I still doing okay for time? Awesome. Um, and so an example of this where I am guilty is I deployed a tool, and the tool's really good. It wasn't the tool's fault, my fault. And I deployed it, so I thought I was awesome. <laughs> I deployed it where every time a dev checked in code, it would scan their code, and it would give me a report of like a software composition analysis, a SAS scan. I was so excited. It would all go into this big um, dashboard where I could see everything. It was awesome, and then it would email that dev and say, hey, I found something if there was a new bug, whereas old bugs, it would just tell me if they fixed one or not. And I'm like, I'm a genius, oh yeah. Uh, and then a few days later, a dev was like, could you please stop humiliating me in front of the entire company? So apparently I'd said it so 
every time anyone made a bug, it would tell everyone in the whole company. <laughs> <laughs> and so a lot of the devs had all turned it off because they're like, I'm receiving 25 emails a day from your stupid new tool. A and then a couple devs were like, I don't feel like I can show my face. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, that really stinks. And I remember one of the security team was like, well, then they can just turn off notifications. I was like, no, let's take time to improve our daily work, which is a big part of DevOps. So I yanked out the whole tool, which did not take long, and I spent two business days making a parent dashboard where I and the security team could see everything, but every single team got their own tiny dashboard with only their stuff, and so they would only hear if they had made a bug that was new, and no one else would hear, so it was not embarrassing, and I was no longer queen of spam. And then <laughs> I was a lot cooler. I don't, maybe cool is a strong word. I was like, not disliked so much, and that was awesome. <laughs> and so. It's important that we worry about efficiency for everyone because I was like, this is awesome for me and my team. This is making every other team's job bad. And so we have to make sure whatever we've done does not negatively affect everyone else. Okay, multiple bug trackers. This sounds really silly, but I've seen this a lot where it's like, oh yeah, we track stuff in GitHub Actions, says team A. And then the QA team's like, yeah, we love Bugzilla. That, that's the other team. And then the security team's like, oh yeah, we use this Excel spreadsheet that's on a shared drive that's not actually shared. Um, and then the devs are supposed to look all over the place for their work. Oh, and also we email random PDFs to teams and tell them there's bugs in there. So this, this approach works terribly. <laughs> this approach is not good because it's hard for them to organize their work. Um, this approach doesn't work well because it's hard for you to organize your work and know where you are because if I've reported five bugs that are super important to me and then it's like here's 20 things for the backlog eventually if you feel like it, but here's five things that are important to me. If they have five other bugs, oh, okay, pretty cool. If they have 500 other bugs, I'm like, how do I get some of mine prioritized? Like, I don't know what they're working on. I don't know what their workload looks like. Like, does it look like a giant cliff that they're gonna fall off of? Does it look like a mountain? Does it look like, you know, big and flat and reasonable? Um, and so, if there are multiple bug trackers, try to see if you can make sure your bugs get into the one they actually look at all day. And I know that sounds obvious, but you'd be surprised how often I see this. Oh, yeah, heartbreak. Okay, next. Insecure system development life cycle. So this one's really, a lot, this happens a lot and a lot, and I'm kind of confused about it. So you're at the AppSec conference, so you already know. When we do the system development life cycle, we need to have more than tools. We need to have conversations. We need to have security requirements. Ideally, we take a look at their design. Ideally, all of those, so who was at ThreadModCon yesterday? The threat modeling conference. Oh yeah, I represent. Ideally, some threat modeling's happening, right? <laughs> Ideally, after it gets out into the world, there's a plan to maintain it and make sure it continues to be secure. And all of those things are conversations. All of those things are plans, and they're, maybe they're a little softer, but I, I work with a lot of companies where they're like, we're doing DevSecOps, we put 27 tools in the pipeline, and I never have to talk to a dev again. I'm like, oh, you don't understand. This is gonna be bad. Um, so it's more important, or it, it's also important to have all the other parts of the system development lifecycle be secure, not just stuff in the CI CD. That's not the start and the end. I worked somewhere once and they're asking me to like co-write this like white paper with them about what shift left meant. And they're like shift left means you need to buy our product. <laughs> oh no, that's not true. And like we kept going back and forth until I just fired myself from the contract. I'm like, I'm just not writing anything with you because those are lies. Um, so we want to start security at the kickoff meeting. Hi, I'm the security person. I'm going to be here throughout your project or like I'm going to add requirements or this or that. And we want to be all the way through and then we want to continue to support after it goes out into prod. And so this system development lifecycle cannot only consist of tools in a CI CD. Okay, this one I haven't seen as often, but the couple of times I saw it was terrible. <laughs> um, so an overly permissive CI CD. So um, twice I've seen this, once with a client that got a $30,000 cloud bill. Um, I saw this talk at Sector, which is uh, in Toronto, a Canadian conference by this guy named Alex Dow, who's the founder of Mirai, which is like this big pen testing company from Canada. And his team hacked a DevOps system and they broke in 27 different ways. <laughs> 27 at one company. 
Um, and so we need to lock this down. So our CI CD is part of our supply chain. So whenever someone's like, we do supply chain security, we're doing SCA, I'm like, you are awesome for doing one part. We also want to secure um, the CI CD, we want to secure our code repository, we want to secure any sort of IDE tools, any sort of sandbox, anything that you need to build your software as part of your CI CD, or as part of your supply chain. And so please lock this down. Don't let randos edit your CI CD. Okay, 14. Automation only in the CI CD. So who here has ever written any code? Okay, a lot of hands. So there are AppSec folks out there who have never written any code. And I want to see, I see you, and you're trying really hard, and that is good. And I want to tell you, you can automate anything you want. You don't need a CI CD. So this often happens with a person who's doing AppSec who previously did, let's say, compliance, and before that, maybe they were a technical writer. And that is okay, but you can actually automate stuff any way you want to. Just ask a dev and they'll help, okay? So you don't have to do things only in the CI CD. Thank you. Um, missing, oh, so hiding mistakes and errors. So that's what this talks about. How can we learn if we never share information? That's what this whole talk's about. I, I want to ask you, um, I don't want to use the word beg, um, implore you to consider sharing more if you can sometimes. So these are lessons I learned after working with a lot of teams and signing hundreds of NDAs. I would like it if more of us could share just a little bit, whether you do what Brooke said, like join a community, mentor someone, there's many, many options, but please try to share lessons learned if you can so all of us can learn. Um, you don't have to stand on a stage. You could just call your friend at another company, but if you can share sometimes, please consider. Okay, and with that, conclusion. So we learned. Uh, some people learn best from knowing what went wrong, which is why the OWASP top 10 is so popular. <laughs> um, we learned, uh, hopefully, how to see DevSecOps from sort of the other side of these problems so that we can try to avoid them. And then, ideally, better rollout strategies, because that's a lot of the rough part with DevSecOps is rolling out. Um, but with that, I wanna give you some resources. So books aren't free, but the rest is. So first of all, oh, that should have lowercase. So all, it's all lowercase, it's case sensitive. So this is the slides. So this will be on the last slide that I show you today as well. But you can just go get the slides right now if you want. It's not in this template, I'm sorry, OWASP. It's in the original template, but same deal, same information. Um, so I run the We Hack Purple community, which is right now merging with the SEMGREP community to be like a mega community, and everything inside is free. So if you want to join the SEMGREP newsletter, you will be invited. If you want to join our Slack, we will give you free support. And if you want to try our product, that is free too. I'm not in charge of making money. I'm in charge of making community. <laughs> if you want to join the We Hack Purple community, I would love to see you there. I want to say thank you to every single person who's been giving me hugs this morning and telling me you're part of We Hack Purple. It warms my heart so much, you have literally no idea. Um, so all of you are invited. We have free AppSec courses, secure coding, and all sorts of stuff. Um, everyone is invited. Um, I am called She Hacks Purple, and I'm all over the internet at that name. Um, so if you liked this, there's way more. Um, and then with that, I would like to thank everyone for their time and attention today. And I want to tell you that, so I work at SEMGREP now, and so I'm going to talk here for a little bit, and then I'm going to go to the SEMGREP booth and hang out and answer questions until people are bored of me. I also have stickers, hugs, and selfies ready for you in case any of those interest you. And with that, thank you, thank you, thank you for having me so much.